Hi, we're here today with David Williams, and he's going to tell a few stories about his childhood. Hi, how's it going? Uh, now, David, we hear that you've had a uh, fundamentally different childhood from a, your uh, normal child. Is that true? Uh, it was, I guess it was kind of off the beaten track to a small extent. It's just, you know, most people, I think, you know, you go to bed and you go to sleep. And, and you know, and sometimes, you know, your grandfather will knock on the door and let you know that it's raining around midnight. And that's just, that's just kind wait, of... Wait a second. With rain around midnight, what do you mean? Well, he was, you know, has this ever happened to you? I've been, you know, you'd be laying in bed and then your grandfather goes, you know, he's like, you're like, yeah, uh, what, what do you want, grandpa? And he just says, it's David, it's raining, you know, it's raining. And then he walks up to the, the slide door, takes you out there and he shows you the rain and all that. And, and the next morning we went outside and like, you know, he, he saw this puddle underneath this shrub and he was like, well, how did that get there? And I was kind of mad about it. And I just said, well, I guess I took it from the house and put it there, you know, and, and, you know, it's just after that, there's this whole reprisal of scavenger hunts, which is, I think is kind of normal with the, uh, the disciplinarian approach of that age. Wait, wait, do you mean a literal scavenger hunt? Well, were you talking about a metaphorical scavenger hunt? I'm not quite sure, but I mean, this happens to a lot of children where you have to search for items in the woods. We have, wait. most backyards have woods. Okay. Wait, but, but well, let's go back. You you went through that information a little bit too fast for us. Now here, here I just thought the person would understand. Here in the studio, could you reenact the, the situation under uh, under which your uh, grandfather came in and told you that it was raining outside? And could you slow down just slightly? Oh, okay, fine. I'll uh, just uh, then, the, and, and I mean specifically do it. Okay, I'm gonna pretend. Specifically? Okay, r ladies and gentlemen, right now we're we're in a uh, studio, and uh, Dave Williams is gonna uh, exit the door and, and, and pretend he's <sighs> the grandfather, and I will be. So um, Okay, here we go. Yeah? Hey, David, David. Yeah. David, David yeah. it's raining outside. David. What? Come on, come on outside, it's raining. You're not going to believe this. There's rain out there. It's midnight. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Barrel out of there. Barrel out that screen door. Bam. That's what happened every day of my childhood. Your grandfather would come out every day of your childhood. He'd come down here and he'd let me know something about midnight. And usually that piece of information, you know, I hate to offend them, you know, God bless them and I hope he's in heaven, but that information was useless. The things he would tell me at midnight was totally useless. But in the end, I'm just saying my formative childhood experience was very lush and rich. It was like a texture that you could bite through. And I'm not saying that as a crazy person. I'm not crazy. I'm just saying that's true. You could bite through that metaphor and come out the other end as a full-formed man. So, wait, but, okay, Let, let's just rewind. So you were asleep at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> Okay. Yes, midnight. It, it was, witching hour. It was literally raining outside, correct? Yeah, it was raining, drip, drop, drip. You know, you hear these little lizards walking all over the window pane. But that's, that, I digress. Okay, and, and as, as everybody knows, your grandfather came up to the door and he knocked on it and said, Yes, yeah, totally is normal. There's nothing wrong with that. He just said, David, David, it's raining outside. Hey, David, David, you know, and I had to, I had to get up because he just wouldn't quit. You know, he just wouldn't keep... I mean, he would, you know, it wasn't just raining. He would let me know, you know, if it was daylight savings time and... I was asleep anyway. I would have found out in the morning. Spring forward, fall back. I'm glad you got the meat for your sandwich, and now you can tell everybody else. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to expound on that point. We're in it. We're in the center of the point. Can't get any closer to it. It's well, like a metal ball at the core of the earth. I understand that, but what I was tr I was trying to elaborate on was the fact that your grandfather was uh, doing this. Look, I'm just trying to say my grandfather never molested me. He just raised me like a normal person, and he just knocked on the door and would tell me stuff in the middle of the night. And then in the morning, you know, if things didn't work out well, I'd have to look for stuff in the forest, and he called that a scavenger hunt. You know, it's, it's a lot, it's character building. That's all it is. It okay. made me who I am today. All right. And I'm a little distressed, but I'm... I'm, I'm just questions. like, it doesn't seem like my points are coming through. Perhaps they're flying all topsy-turvy somewhere. I don't know. Well, you know, maybe I, I got a point in the front yard okay, where it's supposed well, to be in your well, head. Well, can, you, can you explain? Can you break down into steps, step by step by step? This isn't like a study club or... What I'm saying right? is true. How, how am I supposed to learn anything from what you're telling me unless you tell me exactly how he, you would go about these scavenger hunts? Where, where, was there? You a... know, this is it's just it, it, what happened and happened, and that's why I'm you know so successful today in so many arenas and challenging so many people. It's just you know I got a lot of compassion for the world, and that compassion wouldn't have come out unless my grandfather kept me on the tips of my toes. If I was just walking flat on my feet, then you know I wouldn't get anywhere. But if you're on the tips of your toes and you got a lot of energy. And you just start doing really great things, and you start going to school too, and you don't quit. So and he personally character. took it. I was like a lump of burning lava that he cooled over the centuries, and then he molded it, you know, into like a little man, and, and then he filled him with words. If you act like it's a house, and you got to take apart the house, 
and then get like a, the insulation out, and then that's not even good enough if I don't get to the very dead center. I'm not missing the mark here, sir. But, I mean, you're coming at this knowing all of the information at hand. I'm trying to make a word painting okay, here. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay? What I'm saying is, I'm not saying that what my grandfather did was wrong. I'm just saying that there were some odd experiences. But a lot of times in life, you know, you'll have a rainy day, you'll have a sunny day. I think, you know, it happens all over the world. Sometimes God's kind of schizophrenic in that regard. Is that, you know, in Cuba, it might be happy or sunny. You know, I equate emotions with the weather. It might be happy or sunny, but in Russia, it might be raining and or sad. And so what I'm saying is that you have to be ready for all these different shifts that the, you know, the world... But that's not you. what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, specifically, what would your grandfather ask for in these scavenger hunts? He would ask for... Oh, well, that's all you had to... Uh, he, you know, just objects. Objects that he didn't need in the house anymore. Like, you know, maybe a stuffed animal. He'd, he'd put a Ziploc bag around it so it didn't get wet and stuff. And, or a shovel. You know, sometimes he'd say, yeah, I have to dig to find a shovel. And he'd say, do you see the irony in that, you know? And sometimes he'd, you know, he'd take a jar and it'd be empty. And he'd say, you know, you need to put something in this jar, son. And I'd be like, well, what can fit in that jar? And he's like, Any, anything your mind wants to put into it. See, that's lessons like that. But just, you know, things that... It had a meaning, everything that right. I found out in that forest. And, like, I would collect it and kind of put it in the room, and he would he would come in around 12 o'clock and just kind of look around, and he'd be happy. You know? it, it didn't take much to make him happy. That, that's what drives home the realism here, is is the fact that your grandfather specifically picked out objects for you to find, and they were life lessons. Yeah, it's basically the motto of his, of his house was, son, you don't eat to live, you live to live, okay? Or you don't... You live to eat, you don't eat to live. But anyway, that's what it meant. You, you got to go and you got to get. You got to go slash get and go getting. And yeah. to do that, you have to go get stuff out of the forest and you have to find the hidden meaning. So getting meaning, getting meaning. But you, the, you cross the bridge and there's no metaphor. It's just clear transition. I never slept ever, ever with an alarm clock because he was always clapping outside the door, getting me ready to go. And I would bolt out of that out of that room just like a... like. Somebody had blared the trumpets from heaven, and I just went straight out of there like an arrow shot to the clouds. And it's stuff like that that kept me going. And that's how I made all A's, maybe a few B's, when, when some of the scavenger hunts got really complex and it got a little to me back in seventh grade. But otherwise, I was great. I mean, it just, it just, he really got me going in life, and he doesn't believe in any electronics. But anyway, he just helped me out when he got rid of those alarm clocks. I remember when he ripped them out of the walls. But that that was really helpful when he just would, you know, wait, wait, just wait. clap and... Like that. You're gonna have to go back. So your grandfather literally you're not talking about uh uh figuratively. Yeah, I mean literally this isn't like a physical manifestation of something else. This is what it is. This is this. This is this. He See. just said if medieval people weren't doing it, then why should I? That's what I'm saying. So are you saying that your grandfather was Luddite in that situation or I wouldn't say he's a part of a religious sector philosophy, but Luddite, yeah, he he did he did believe in, you know, just having enough to get you going. Yeah, he only believed in things that would help you build character. Okay, uh, so. specifically get you going. Do, do, do you mean are you are, do you mean sustenance? And mostly he's talking about philosophy, but of course philosophy is also a tactile thing that needs to be expressed in everyday life, like eating. So yes, it was about sustenance. Okay, well, uh, you you've brought around one of my uh, my next points was excellent. Your your, uh, your grandfather had had a, was very tactile sensitive, correct? Right. Yes. He. He had some problems reading books, and it didn't have to do with the plot. I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean to offend anybody with that bold statement, but he just he had a problem holding. You know, he'd be looking at a book and thinking he's reading chapter three, and he'd look down, and all of a sudden it'd be on the floor, and the pages would be flipping in the wind, and you know, and it was kind of like he thought nature was mocking him or something that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't flip the pages and hold the book, but you know, something like the wind could come down there and do whatever it wanted. Okay, and 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 right now I'm just gonna have to stop and say again. <laughs> You are not talking figuratively. You're talking literally. I'm talking literally. He'd be sitting there on the couch trying to read a book. He once tried to read Where the Red Fern Grows. He said, oh, man, this chapter six is great. This is so great. And he had his hands on his knees. I, I said, Grandpa, you're not reading Where the Red Fern Grows. The Red Fern Grows is on the is on the floor. You haven't been reading it. It's been on the floor the whole time. He's just looking and saying, no, no. And, you know, he, he was such a great man. And he, he fought in so many battles, but he couldn't do something so simple as flip the pages of a book. And... One day he just got really mad and he said, I'll show you how to flip a book. And he flipped it up against the ceiling. And I remember I couldn't get over that for about two weeks. It was, just a, it was a real hard emotional center and I, I kept having to skirt around it. Right, so you're saying everything that he did was to make he's, his he's, life... ba he's basically been living on a different wavelength from people. It's actually a higher wavelength. And so his problems actually look like problems to us, but they're actually, I'd say, uh, you know, successes, really. I would, I would say they're assets, his problems. 
And, but to us, they look like they, they would drag us down, but to him, they're just like little pieces of gear that you get from a souvenir shop and you go flying off with them. He's Make so good at life at this point, he doesn't have to do anything. You know, he just, he has other contraptions to, to do things for him. He just touches something or he, he makes problems to solve other problems, basically. That's what I'm saying. It sounds like he's doing this out of sheer boredom. Is that is that the case, or is there well, he's some... so great that everything bores him? I mean, if you had his kind of knowledge, you were in his headspace, you'd be bored with everything. I mean, That's most good. most people are like fascinated by a great movie, a great movie. He's he's made things that nobody can even understand, and that's what makes him so great. And he's in books. You know, he he once walked into Barnes and Noble. And he just glanced over the shelves. And he's like, man, reading is so dumb. And I was like, well, what do you what do you have that's better, Grandpa? And he showed me. He, he took me home and showed me. And it was amazing. I cannot believe what he does instead of reading. And it is amazing. Uh, what, what this thing Well, is. it's like trying to describe manna from heaven. What exactly was manna from heaven? No one knows. Well, we all know what the most important sense is. And that's the sense of self. Okay, so he just, you know, that's all I'll say there. Okay. So, and I mean, feeling. There is, a, there is a little sense of feeling, but not in the literal touch sense, but in the kind of a metaphorical. You told me a long time ago the story about your um your uncle and right, uh, right. about him firing a gun off in the house. Um, could yeah, you, I mean, I think I think this will this will bridge the gap between. Okay, this will make sense of everything I've said because I have been talking kind of in this high educational tone. But my uncle basically is was a student of my grandfather for a while, but it didn't really work out. And one day, my uncle, to impress my grandfather, my uncle came in. And he was drunk and started dragging around dirty clothes, started dragging it down this around the the hall and all that and. You know, my grandfather, he just said, you know, drunk son of a bitch, you know, and, and my uncle was like, I'll show him. And he got like this 22 gauge and was trying to load it on the bed and of course it fired into the ceiling and my grandfather burst in, you know, he just kind of shoved his palm through the door. Wait, and, wait, your, your grandfather burst into the room? Yeah, he, he just burst in there when he heard the gunshot, you know, because... Okay, and, and it angled up into the ceiling, the, the bullet? Yeah, the, the, yeah, he was so drunk he was trying to load the gun and it shot and went off into the ceiling. And my grandfather just, you know, tried to take a swing at Steve, at my uncle. But my uncle was in a self-induced daze that he put himself into over the following six, previous six hours. And he fell backwards on the bed before the punch connected on his jaw. Um, but had my grandfather connected with that hit, as he has connected with so many things in the past, he would have broken that jaw. But in, but in the end, he just picked the, the gun up from, from Mr. Steve, my uncle, and disassembled the gun, you know, in his typical unconscious fashion and then steve just kind of laid there in his stupor but that was you know steve has just tried to express himself in a way that really doesn't link up with what you know jay hugh is trying to teach my grandfather and i think i think that's a palpable and um illustrative little story that kind of takes everything you've said before this and it kind of puts it into like a, a condensed form to understand you're either you're either living like him my grandfather and trying to understand him or you're living under a bridge and you're just drinking and doing a lot of stuff that, you know, is out of tune with them. That's it. Well, I thank you for being here today. And I'm, I'm kind of, I calm down a little. I'm not as... I'm okay now. I, I, I'm, I'm just glad that we, we got the, it's uh, just like the, the difference a, between yeah. metaphorical and you gotta, literal. You got to get the contextual, literal stuff separated from the metaphor. Or you're never going to get out of this kind of... Uh, yeah, it, it, it kept sounding like you were talking a metaphor, but after... No, no, it's all... Once you get to the actual understanding, then all of my words from the beginning of the interview will make sense to you, and it'll just hit you, and you'll say, "Wow, I wish I was related to that guy's grandfather." So, all right, well, thanks for being here today. Yeah, I guess I'll go over to Drive this way. All right.